Welcome along to another Coronavirus Update podcast. I'm Marcus Stead, and as usual, I'm joined by veteran campaigner and blogger Greg Lance Watkins. At the time of recording, early on the morning of the 14th of April, we are pretty close to 2 million global cases of the COVID-19 virus. So we're going to be reflecting on that and what these figures mean. We're also going to be putting into context the situation in European countries such as Spain and Italy and France, where Greg and I both agree that we are not that close in any meaningful sense to restrictions being lifted and the number of cases and the number of deaths is sadly still very serious indeed. Well, first of all, I'd like to wish all of our listeners a happy Easter. This is, well, the start of spring, really, and we've had the weather to go with it. I'm also also aware that in the Jewish calendar, we're about midway through Passover at the moment. And in the Islamic calendar, Muslims all over the world are preparing for Ramadan. So this is a time of year where people want to be together. They want to worship together, be around their families. And even people who don't believe in anything or of a different faith, they want to go to the beach, have days out over the Easter weekend. And people have not been able to do that. And I think 90% of people in Britain do seem to get the message. And that was the impression I got over the course of the Easter weekend. But I'm afraid, Greg, there is still about a minority of, say, 10 percent who I notice when I'm out and about uh, looking out the window, even on my balcony, on the footpath outside my flat. People are mixing, meeting up with friends, standing far too close to each other. There is a significant minority that still don't get the message. Well, I guess at the end of the day, life is all about survival of the fittest. Perhaps they'll kill each other off. Well, that's that, that's a flippant way of putting it. But you've got to remember, even if it was as simple as that, and it's not, they are carriers and they are going to pass it on to others inadvertently. They are, by definition, through their stupidity and their selfishness, if they even have to make an essential journey getting on a bus and they're alongside doctors and nurses, their stupidity and their selfishness is putting them in danger. Well, that is the whole point, isn't it? Because do bear in mind that the government's policy of a lockdown is not to eradicate the disease. Um, Although the simplistic and idiotic tend to criticise them because uh, of the way they're behaving as a government, uh, when in fact they are actually performing uh, fantastically well, in my opinion, with absolutely no blueprint and no guidelines from any past experience of anybody anywhere alive today. It's all very well scientists prognosticating about what they should do. The scientists don't have any experience of it either. They're frequently quoting models of what happens and in their predictions when the models are hopelessly wrong because they've got nothing to model it on. And it's worth remembering, as we we touched on last week, and again, this is worth reiterating, just how little we actually know about it. Now, take something like the so the so-called antibody test. By the way, notice how little we've heard about that in the last few days. We don't know once you've had the virus, does it give you a month, three months, six months, 12 months immunity, a lifetime's immunity, or no immunity at all? And the other thing to bear in mind, if you are a doctor or a nurse and you have had the virus, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still be a carrier if you get on the bus or the train or to go to work at your hospital, or even touching a handrail inside the hospital, you could still be a carrier. So as we discussed in quite some depth last week, the value of these uh, antibody tests, I think, has been massively overstated. But one of the big stories we've seen in the news in the last 24 hours has been the situation in Spain, where... I haven't seen this particularly well reported anywhere. There's been a so-called easing of lockdown restrictions, but what's actually happened here, as far as I can tell, is that the definition of what constitutes a key worker has been changed. And by that, I mean who will be allowed to open from today, the 14th of April, 
are things like children's clothes shops, uh, shops that sell stationery, and some construction projects will be allowed to continue, but home improvements will not be allowed to resume. Now, in terms of children's clothing, if you have a young child and you've been in lockdown for many weeks, it may well be that those children have outgrown their clothes or are close to outgrowing their clothes and need to buy new clothes is therefore essential. So there's been a redefinition of what constitutes uh, an essential worker. We are still a very long way in Spain from normal life resuming. We are nowhere near at the stage where they're going to open uh, bars, restaurants, uh, resume sporting events, that sort of thing. That is still nowhere near, not even on the horizon. And if I look at the number of cases, to give some context, we'll focus on Spain for the time being. In terms of cases, on the 26th of March, there were 8,271. On the 8th of April, there were 6,278. And on the 11th of April, there were 4,754. And in terms of deaths, on the 2nd of April, 961. The 6th of April, 700. Then it went up again to, on the 8th of April to 747. Then it went down again on the 11th of April to 525. Then it went up again on the 12th of April to 603. Now we can see that they're taking a sort of, the, the Prime Minister of Spain has taken a, a, a balanced approach to the need for parents to buy children's clothing, the need for people to buy some stationery, the need for certain very important construction projects to resume. But it, it, you, you can see that this, the statistics there, they're painting a mixed, mixed picture in Spain. There is no clear sign that they've got this thing under control. Also do bear in mind in Spain that there is regional uh, separation and decision-making and devolved rights to different regions and those rules which apply to Madrid in the main do not apply in Catalonia to Barcelona. A very important point because the leader of the devolved institution in Catalonia has said that these slightly relaxed restrictions will not happen there. He profoundly disagrees with the Prime Minister of Spain um, and he is saying we are absolutely sticking to our lockdown measures. Now, you can see, okay, let's, let's move the discussion on a little bit to Italy in that case. Um, on the 20, in terms of cases now, on the 21st of March, there were 6,557. On the 4th of April, there were 4,605. So that's a significant drop over that what two-week period. On the 7th of April, three days later, um, down to 3,039. But then four days after that, they leapt up again quite significantly to 4,694. And in terms of deaths, 27th of March, 919. The 6th of April, 636. By the 9th of April, that had gone down slightly to 610. But two days later, the 11th of April, went up again to 619. So there's a mixed picture there. And it does seem as though restrict, uh, lifting restrictions in any way, shape or form is very, very risky. Well, I think something worth remembering is that this entire worldwide pandemic started with one person mm. getting COVID-19. Mm. That spread from that person to maybe five. And at the moment, so far, it spread to approximately two million recorded cases. Now, look at recorded. That's 1,921,966. Unless, of course, you're a British politician. And then God knows what that reads out at, on, at a podium. Um, and you'll find that that's a tiny percentage. It's those who have been admitted to hospital where the hospital's opinion and rudimentary test would indicate that the person has COVID-19. That does not include the many who b have phoned into medical services 
and found that um, yes, they've got all the symptoms of COVID-19, please go home and stay in isolation for uh, 14 days. If you haven't got the symptoms after seven days, uh, then possibly you can reconsider the condition as safe and you can associate a little more widely, like go and do your shopping, um, but please stay at home. All of those tens, probably millions of people who are in that position do not feature on this list. Yeah, the basic, the basic point here is that we know that people are dying in care homes and people dying at home are not included, certainly not in the British statistics. But France, we had um, President Macron uh, announcing yesterday that the, uh, the lockdown in France will certainly continue into early May. Now, the, the daily recorded cases in France are very, very strange reading. I'll explain. 2nd of April, new cases, 2,116. The very next day, that shot up tenfold to 23,060. The day after that, so the 4th of April, down to 7,788. And we had this up and down scenario, a bad day on the 7th of 11,059. Um, and then we've got the late the last three days are available, the 10th of April, 7,120. 11th of April, 4,785, 12th of April, 2,937. But what you look, if you look at the graph, is that you get these enormous peaks. Like, uh, I just read out the worst example, but another example, 6th of April, 5,171, 6th of April, 11,059. So you get these sort of weird peaks now and again. Now, in terms of the death toll in France, their worst day was on the, um, the 7th of April, 1,417. That then dropped the day after that, the 8th of April, to 541. That then shot up again the day after that to 1,341. And we've had three days of decline in, in the period since. So in France, you, you get sort of a few days, then you get an enormous spike. Um, and again, I don't know to the extent to which in countries like France, the extent to which they're not including those who are dying in care homes and those who are dying at home. I suspect they've got very similar problems to those that we have. But the basic point I'm getting at is, I'm afraid for all this talk about, oh, we're a week away, two weeks, three weeks away from the peak, countries which apparently are two or three weeks ahead of us, like Spain, I'm afraid, Greg, I don't see enough solid evidence that they have peaked or at the very least, if we restricted their, 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 their lockdown in any way at all, that there wouldn't be a second wave very, very quickly. I'm afraid I just don't see any evidence that the end is in sight, even in countries that are two or three weeks ahead of us. And before you even mention China, we are seeing point one, there does appear to be a second wave well underway. And point two, I don't believe anything the Chinese government says anyway. Um, I think you're spot on right about China. I don't even bother looking at their figures anymore because I know they're fantasy. Um, and we know that for certain. They didn't have COVID-19 until the very end of December. Yet we know that people were dying of it in November. It was reported um, to the World Health Organization by a doctor who is now sadly dead. Um, from the virus. Um, it was reported, I'm not sure if it was the end of November or the beginning of December, uh, and he got into tremendously hot water with the Chinese authorities uh, for daring to tell the truth. Mm. We have much the same problem in areas in Britain, where, for instance, the Regional Assembly in Wales uh, more or less issued an edict to the press that they are not allowed to interview anyone from the health service without telling that person that they're not allowed to be interviewed or give an interview to the press. Can I this be more specific gagging. there because this is so important what you've just said. I'll let you back in in a sec but this is so important. This is a story that came out on Bank Holiday Monday and it was only reported on um, the Penarth news site run by David Morris-Jones, the, um, 
He was actually the editor of BBC Wales Today in the 1980s. He then moved, uh, he spent a period working for TBS television in the south of England, the old ITV franchise. He runs this very good hyperlocal news website. And the, the first paragraph, he's the only person reporting this, the first paragraph reads, the Welsh Labour government has issued what it calls media guidelines instructing all journalists that they must, in inverted commas, inform NHS Wales staff that they are not allowed to give, inverted commas again, unauthorised interviews. Now, this is, um, this, and two paragraphs on, David writes, the Labour guidelines appear to be designed to echo restrictions on whistleblowers imposed by the communist governments in China and North Korea. And I think he's hit the nails on the head there. And in the next paragraph, he's used the word censorship which is exactly what it is. The Welsh government is trying to bully journalists in Wales into not reporting the failings in personal protective equipment and various other failings in the Welsh NHS. And they're also trying to bully journalists in this. They're also trying to bully NHS staff. And in a democracy uh, with a free and open press, that is totally unacceptable. And what is astonishing is this was not reported at BBC Wales, where David worked when it still had some reputation years ago, decades ago, I should say. ITV Wales didn't report it. And what the nearest we have to a Welsh media, Wales Online, the Western Mail, the Echo, they didn't report it. It's been left to a hyper-local news blogger of 80 years of age is the only person reporting this. And I think that is an absolute disgrace. The full details of that will be on one of my websites uh, by the morning. and you'll find that this all pertains to the fact that this is a Labour-led and managed regional council that has been in existence for 21 years and has achieved the sum total of sod all for Wales or the Welsh, bearing in mind that the NHS is a devolved responsibility of the Regional Assembly for Wales. This is an obscenity. This is a removal of freedom of speech that is utterly unacceptable. And personally, I believe that morally, those responsible for issuing that edict should be called on to resign. I agree they with have you. No place in mm. British democracy. They are a disgrace, not just to the Labour Party, but to the entire democratic process. Very well said. Very well said. But this, this, I think, um, and I don't want to get too parochial in this because I know a very large number of our listeners come from outside Wales. But in the United Kingdom context this entire pandemic has, has brought through the flaws of devolution and is it, they've created the problems which wouldn't have existed 25 years ago in the days before devolution in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, for example, we had some weeks ago now, several weeks ago, there was a media briefing uh, on, a wen on a Wednesday of that week where Boris Johnson, before he became ill, proudly announced that 504,303 people had offered their services as NHS volunteers uh, more than double the target of 250,000 that the English Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, had outlined at the previous day's press briefing. And that was a very heartwarming response. It showed the British people at their most charitable and the most decent. Many thousands of people here in Wales were ready and willing to play their part, only to discover that the scheme only applied to England, and they had to look to the Welsh government for instructions as to what they should do. And put simply, in the years before devolution, this would not have been a problem. And those very same volunteers would now be either working in the NHS as volunteers, carrying out important duties, or just days away from doing so. And that same Wednesday morning, when Boris Johnson announced that, Vaughan Gething, the Welsh Health Minister, said that local councils were coordinating their efforts for NHS volunteering in Wales, and the not very widely advi read advice from the Welsh Local Government Association was that people should call their council contact centres. Now that's about as clear as mud. So in other words, the kind-spirited Welsh citizens wanting to help the NHS 
are being asked to find out the number of their local council call centre, which is probably understaffed in the present circumstances, then wait in a queue while the staff answer calls from people inquiring about which colour bin bags to put out this week. Clear and coordinated, this is not. And we also have various other things, like there's this scheme in England about um, supermarkets, um, where there was a database put together of 1.5 million people who should really be prioritised for um, supermarket home delivery slots. And they were passed, they, they were passed on to uh, Sainsbury's, Tesco, and about four or five other well-known supermarkets. In Wales and in Scotland, no such database exists and the supermarkets do not know who to prioritize in terms of not just the elderly but those who've had cancer treatments in the last five years or whatever and have weakened immune systems and this is just showing we live on a small island this virus does not give a monkeys about hadrian's wall or offers dyke and we are seeing how devolution is, is leading to an uncoordinated muddled response and it's i'm not going to mix my words here it's putting people's lives at risk i'm 74 i'm in the kill zone i've had cancer i've had chemotherapy i've had radiotherapy i have no right coronary artery i have a defective heart and i have a certain amount of breathing difficulty if i take any form of exercise i didn't get a letter no and you, you, I you are the Welsh Health Service. Yeah, you are just over the border from Wales, um, and you're, you're sort of well. You tell us. Come on, what, 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 what do you come under for certain things? You've got a certain amount of choice, haven't you? Um, I, I'm actually. I did live in Chepstow. Hmm. Um, I came under the Royal Gwent Hospital from the point of view of the health service. Um, hmm. And I might add that the Royal Gwent Hospital, uh, they announced that under um, management of the Regional Assembly in Cardiff, um, the NHS Royal Gwent Hospital A&E department, over 50% of their staff now have been tested and are have the COVID-19 virus. Yes. Over 50% of the staff of the Royal Gwent NHS Hospital. Mm. Now, I have had excellent service, mainly because I have gone out of my way to uh, bully and cajole to make damn sure I did. Um, using both the media and my MP to make sure that they didn't manage to kill me so far. And I note that having had chemo and radiotherapy at Valindra Hospital, which is North Cardiff, uh, some uh, 40 miles from where I live, and having had to travel there every single day, drive there and drive back while I was having the treatment, um, they lost their first nurse uh, to COVID-19 the day before yesterday. Mm. And my thoughts are with her family and with her colleagues. Yeah, I, I echo that completely. I'm a great admirer of uh, Valindra Hospital myself. I've, I've done fundraising stuff for them in the past. I've, I've got a tremendous respect. I know how well they looked after you and I know how well they looked after, I think, of two people in particular who sadly didn't make it. But even, uh, even when it was clear they weren't going to make it, Valindra really went out of their way to make things as comfortable and as peaceful as possible for them when things were really not looking well, good. Well, I'd be very fortunate. I've been very fortunate. I've had my uh, treatment overseen by Val Valindra's consultants uh, since uh, the beginning of the 2000s. I, in fact, presented uh, the first time with cancer in 1997, and I'm still here annoying people. So what the hell? Yeah. Uh, I shall aim to continue to do it long after COVID. 19 um, 
has stopped being a completely unknown, ununderstood threat. I'm not saying that it will have stopped. Um, there is every reason to believe that it could continue. Uh, now, this, this, is, this, year is, in, this year is out. This is important. This is very, very important. And as we conclude this podcast, therefore, I would say, based on what I said a few moments ago about the, the figures we're getting out of Spain, Italy, France, and I could have gone on for much longer, by the way, but it is clear, I'm afraid, folks, that all this, this narrative that's been in the mainstream media the last few days, that the end is in sight in some sort of way and lockdown restrictions will come to an end, I'm afraid I just don't see it. There is not much evidence that we've got this thing under control. We know so little about how the virus works. I don't know about you, but it does seem clear to me that we're going to be living under these very unusual circumstances for some considerable time to come. And by that, I certainly mean more than a few weeks. I think something that is well worth th thinking of here, you have said in repeating politicians that we haven't reached the peak yet. The whole point of the lockdown is not to kill off the virus. It is so that we never reach a peak. We spread this disease out over a period of time without a peak by controlling the speed at which the population get the disease. The aim being that instead of having everybody presenting at the front door of their local hospital with COVID-19 in the next seven days, some 80% of the population, the NHS would be unable to treat them. If a hundred people turn up needing for their survival, the use of one ventilator, 99 of them will die. Therefore, we don't want a peak. We have a lockdown so that it slows it down so that only one person presents at a time to be treated on each of the many ventilators that are available through the health service. And to repeat what we've already said in this podcast, and we've said in previous podcasts as well, and that is we simply don't know what level of immunity you get once you've had the virus. And May I go even further? There is, let us, <laughs> there are other diseases, malaria, is a, a disease, it's not a virus, but it's a disease which once you've got it, it will give you a bad time for a while and then it will die away and people will think that they are recovered. No, it has gone to hibernate in the liver and will emerge with no warning at a time in the future. And I've had malaria now for, I suppose, about 35 years. I had it in Africa. The last time I was um, in a malarial area was South America in the end of the 1970s. And I still get repeats of malaria. They're less frequent and they're less severe. Hmm. But take another example, which is a virus, herpes. Yes, most of us have had herpes in the form of chicken pox, but there's herpes one and herpes two, which are uh, herpes in the, of the mouth and gentle herpes which i'm very pleased to say i don't have um, either of those but they retreat to an area adjoining the spine and you think that you are fully recovered until the next bout 
which can be as soon as two weeks later where the sores return and this will go on for the rest of your life covid 19 could be just sort of that sort of virus and don't talk to me about vaccines we have been looking for a vaccine for the common cold since vaccines were discovered yeah and even if even if a vaccine is discovered for this we're talking a, a good year 18 months and i tell you another thing and this is where I, I want this discussion to go next is that you can guarantee as soon as a vaccine is created or even looks like they're coming close we will have uh, conspiracy theorists on social media putting up uh, tweets and posters on facebook and videos to YouTube and here, there, and everywhere, that this is some sort of new world order trying to take us over, and David Icke will be on the case. It'd be the same sort of people I mean, that Peter uh, Hitchin already is. Well, well, yeah, Peter Hitchens is just about how can I put this? He acknowledged that it exists, and, and if you look at the stuff Peter Hitchens was writing weeks ago, it, it's now looking absolutely absurd. When um, when he was he was well, look, my answer to Peter Hitchens is very very simple. You go and ask any nurse or doctor in Lombardy if what they have seen in the last two or three weeks is a typical late March, early April day in their hospital? The answer is very obviously no. And by the way, whilst I'm on the subject of that, can I say a very well done to a superb piece of television I saw the other day, a half hour documentary Into the Red Zone, part of the Into the Red Zone series on Sky, Stuart Ramsey, who is one of the best foreign affairs reporters in the world, that half hour he did from Italy, exposing what life is really like in Northern Italy now in the hospitals, in the streets, in business and everything else, was an absolutely superb piece of television. He deserves huge credit. But going back to where I was a second ago on social media, I'm getting really fed up with two things now. One is people use the old, the old saying from World War II, careless talk costs lives, and be like dad, keep mum, and these walls have ears. The, those famous posters we've all seen. The modern day equivalent is careless talk on social media. I am sick to death of seeing conspiracy theories saying various things, whether it's um, 5G phone masks are causing this, or it's just another strain of flu is the other one. That is annoying me. And the other thing that's getting me, which I'm deliberately ignoring, is the sheer amount of spite and hate from the sort of Corbynista wing of the left if you like. And that, that's taken various forms in the last week. And the one in the last 24 hours, now that Boris Johnson is showing signs of recovery and was able to do a short video message, oh, this is all a bit convenient, isn't it? When I had the virus or when I was in hospital, it took me, it knocked me out for several weeks. Well, the whole point, well, one thing we do know about this virus is that it affects people to varying degrees and the recovery period um, varies enormously as well. And they're trying to make out that the whole Boris Johnson thing was some kind of conspiracy. Now, all I would say to that is it was blatantly obvious in the week leading up to Boris Johnson's hospitalization. He was posting daily videos. He was looking more and more ill by the day. Of that, there is no doubt. And for this to be a conspiracy, you'd Marcus. need... You'd, hang on, let me just finish. I'll let you back in. You need various people in St. Thomas's Hospital, every single member of staff, would have to comply with this conspiracy. And what we've actually seen is excellent doctors and nurses helping Boris Johnson back to health in a short space of time. And they deserve credit for what they've done for him and what they've done for many, many others. And I think people peddling these conspiracies are an absolute disgrace. I'll let you back in. Marcus, um, uh, apologizing for, uh, for interrupting, but you really ought to get the facts on that. It was Cambridge Analytica and the Russians who in invested with the Tories in a great deal of research to work out a program of how to generate all the symptoms without any of the danger. Yeah, well, this, is, this is the sort of crap we've been reading on social media and it's dangerous nonsense. Of course it is, but that was actually a comment made by somebody who I really think for the sake of their um, future peace of mind, not their credibility because they have none, a left-wing commentator 
made that comment. I saw somebody who was employed as a presenter on BBC Radio Cymru retweeted a comment along those same lines. This is how absurd this is now becoming. And I, I'm just sick to death of it. I think people, look, be very, very careful what you put on social media. We do not need misinformation or dangerous lies at the moment. So please tread very carefully. I like to end, as I always do, on a positive note. Now, we try and stay cheerful and stay happy and enjoy life as best we can within the restrictions. We've been fairly fortunate this last week in that uh, we've had mostly good weather, though we've had two of the last three days we've had high winds. And in fact, right now that I can hear winds, as I live in a waterfront flat, winds against the window here whistling. Um, though the Easter weekend was mostly pleasant. How have you been keeping yourself amused and entertained over the course of the last week? Well, this evening, um, there's nothing entertaining about it at all. We're back down to minus, not minus, sorry. We're back down to five degrees. Hmm. at the moment and um, that will probably drop another one or two degrees during the next two to three hours before it starts warming up again um this is all due to um, i'm convinced greta thunberg all <laughs> her fault without a doubt um this is the, the global warming that she has uh, promised us all and it just isn't happening hmm. um I guess that um, that's probably one of the reasons why she's been particularly quiet recently. We did a great her podcast. Last, her last the great day. foray, mm. her last great foray, of course, um, on the verge of a complete lockdown being called, was to gather together thousands of gullible young people in Bristol and trample the entire center into a mud bath with all these people nice and close together so that they could generate a hotspot for COVID-19. Yeah, we, we, we haven't seen you, much of the, we haven't seen much of Dear Greta recently, but for those who haven't heard it, there was a, there's a great podcast still available on the talk podcast platforms. Uh, whether you listen, look, listen via the website, via iTunes, via Spotify, however you listen to these podcasts, there's a great podcast where Greg and I completely debunk the theory of man-made climate change using data and sensible evidence and everything else. But what is interesting, you mentioned Greta Thunberg. We remember just a matter of months ago, Greta Thunberg was everywhere. We were always debating Brexit. We were always debating VAR. The annoying people were the wokes who were everywhere all the time. Their everything was transphobic and LGBTQ plus QRSTUV plus phobic. All of that seems to have gone completely on the back burner now. I actually, I did prefer it in the days where we debated Brexit and VAR all the time. But where we people are didn't now... People die of that. <laughs> no, exactly. People didn't die of that. And it just seems as though all sorts of things have gone on the back burner, including the disappearance of uh, Greta Thunberg so that is something but what have you been doing with your time you've been out enjoying the sunshine you were telling us last week about your garden what progress have you made uh, I made a lot of progress I'm part of um, the lockdown that I've found really irksome has been the fact that garden centers are closed now this is just the time of year when I would be picking up uh, trays of seedlings for my vegetable garden and I would be planting another round of potatoes because and this year it's more important that I do because I don't want to go out shopping as much and there is likely to be a greater call on um, decent fresh vegetables etc because travel will be reduced there will be problems with uh, picking many of these crops uh, because labor will not be able to gather together in big numbers to actually lift the crops um, at harvest and i want my garden to have lots of vegetables i've got quite a sizable gar vegetable garden for the two of us 
My, my yeah. favourite potato story was the, uh, the great football manager, Brian Clough, who was uh, managing Nottingham Forest. And he's originally from Middlesbrough. And this was years and years ago now. Well, he's been dead 15 years now. But it was a story, must have been the late 80s, early 1990s, where um, he gave his players a few days off. And uh, one of his players, he overheard him mention, he said, oh, I've got a few days off. I think I'll go and see my family in Middlesbrough. Brian Clough said, young man, you're going to go to uh, Middlesbrough, you say. Well, I'm from there. He said, listen, I need you to do me a favour. Call in at this address. And he wrote, um, he wrote the, um, the address on there. And he said, this, this person's got a package for you. And, and it's for me. And bring it back with you when you come back. And uh, this player went, went to this address. And was knocked on a fairly unassuming front door. And somebody answered the door. He said, uh, I understand you've got a package for uh, Brian Clough. And he said, oh, yeah. It was an absolutely enormous sack of potatoes. And um, he put it, uh, he carried it to this, this car. And then a few days later, he drove back to Nottingham and uh, reported for duty, reported for training. And he said, look, boss, uh, I've got this huge sack of potatoes. He said, oh, good, good, young man. Let, let's collect it then. Opened up the boot of the car. There were the potatoes. Brian Clough opened them up, this, this big sack. He picked out a potato. He sniffed. He goes, oh, smell that. Doesn't that smell wonderful? Oh, yeah, smells good, doesn't it? And then a really good, fresh potato there. He said, there we go. You can have one for doing that for me. He gave him one bloody potato. <laughs> that, that's a typical Brian Clough story, that. But um, that, that's, that's my, uh, my favourite story of, uh, when it comes to potatoes. So you would normally be, you want to grow your own desperately, but you can't. Well, inter interestingly, when you say potatoes, there's an old saying of once a potato farmer, always a potato farmer. Yeah. And the reason for that is that it is very difficult not to wind up after having had a crop of potatoes with what are termed illegal immigrants the next year mm. um, they're the ones that you missed and at the end of last year we decided we weren't going to do potatoes anymore because they were too much like hard work you've got to dig the damn things up etc and you've got to dig to do it and uh, I'm not very up to digging physically. Um, so we actually went over the ground with a fine tooth comb to make sure we didn't leave any potatoes in there. Oh, no. No, <laughs> now, now you wish you hadn't done that. But... Oh, yes. I wish I'd left um, substantial numbers in there. <laughs> and, and what is the advantage? How... The thing is, I obviously, I, I haven't got a garden. I haven't got an allotment. What is, in terms of taste and flavour, how much better is a homegrown potato compared to what we get in the supermarkets? Most of the time, if you're buying in a supermarket, you can expect the potatoes to be several months old. Mm. Um, you may well find they're actually last seasons. Mm. Um, you'll also find that uh, we have some chickens. Uh, you'll find that eggs from the supermarket when you break them uh, into the pan, sort of go flat. Mm. They have no texture to them left. Um, if you break a fresh egg into the pan, it will stand up, the yolk will be very circular and also very domed. Mm. And it doesn't run all over the pan. Yeah. Um, and they taste much better. Uh, but eggs that you eat in the supermarket can be astonishingly old uh, in that they are stored at, I believe it's one degree. And there are plastic strips hanging on the doors, doorways. Um, and I think there's three airlocks to get into where the eggs are stored. Uh, the reason being that if somebody bangs a door, uh, that vibration will break every egg in the store. Yeah. They're very, very fragile when they're very cold, but they do last a long time. Um, you'll find that um, permission is granted by health and, uh, and safety, um, food-wise, that you can have up to one third of soft fruit, uh, fresh soft fr fruit m with mildew mm. when you buy it in a supermarket. Um, I 
quite like my fruit without mildew. Uh, yes, I, I do as well. So what you're saying then is, okay, your potatoes, go back to your potatoes. If I was to make mashed potatoes or roast potatoes or even chips with what you're growing or what you'd like to grow in your garden, it is in terms of quality significantly ahead of if I was to do the same with what I bought from the supermarket. That's what you're saying. Uh, I get the reward for that. Uh, you do indeed. And may I ask what brand of potatoes you buy? Uh, it varies hugely because it's, it's again, I, I tend to prefer if I can, there's an independent greengrocer about a 20 minute walk from where I am now. If I buy it from there, or if I buy it from the market in the center of Cardiff, the indoor market, I am much happier than if I buy them from the supermarket. I notice a, a huge difference in quality even by doing that. So I, I, not, I, I can't go into brand names or, or what have you, but I well, do I, I, You see, this is, this is the whole point. I don't go into brand names. Hmm. I don't go into where they're purchased. Hmm. I go into the stock of potato. Are they King Edwards? Are uh, they Paris uh, Piper? Or I, are they um, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, because yeah. each d fulfills a different task. King Ed Edwards make absolutely brilliant baked potatoes. The mm. bigger ones, if you're having them earlier on, they roast well. Mm. Maris Piper is quite a good all round, etc. Mm. Mm. So, and so when what, you what, think, yeah, so you, you've told us about roast potatoes. What's best for like chips and mashed potatoes then? I don't know, to be honest. I'm not very good at it, but my mm. wife is. <laughs> we'll say me, we, we, she tells me which to plant. But an, one fact um, a friend of mine's son took over his uh, Hereford farm um, where he was one of the uh, top Hereford cattle breeders and the son took over and said look Hereford's um, you need a specialist animal nowadays um, you need dairy cattle for dairy and you need beef cattle for beef mm -hmm. uh, and Herefords basically have too much bone to the beef, therefore making it not a very uh, productive beef cattle, and they don't have big enough udders and milk yield to make them dairy cattle. They're a good all-round cattle, but that doesn't pay anymore. You yeah. have to specialize. So he switched to potatoes. He produces acres and acres and acres of potatoes and he produces them for a well-known chip um sorry crisp manufacturer mm -hmm. in order to get them the right whiteness for the crisp manufacturer he sprays them three times during the season with suntan lotion <laughs> I kid you not, it's a special spray he puts on the leaves to stop them absorbing too much chlorophyll, producing too much chlorophyll, and thereby making the potato more yellowy. Just remember that next time you tuck into a packet of crisps, everyone. That's, that's what I'd say. So in conclusion, what have you been watching on the telly this week? Has anything caught your eye? Uh, yeah, the total absence of anything worth watching. It really has been embarrassingly bad on Freeview. Mm. Uh, it, <laughs> we discussed this over the weekend. Yesterday, for instance, there was, on Monday, well, there was Dolly Parton or Dolly Parton, and yeah. then there was some Dolly Parton, but there wasn't anything on any other channel. Working nine to five, what a way to make a Leave living. Leave it to her. Don't give up the day job. <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, and what, what's, the age, what's the age gap between you and Dolly? Seven days, and I was very annoyed in the uh, biography. They didn't mention that fact. Older or younger? Uh, she's older, of course. Yeah. 
by seven days. Yeah. But I tell um, you what, though, you, you, you if do I make... Looked, if I looked as good um, as she does, uh, I too would have made that kind of fortune. <laughs> Little known fact about Dolly Parton. She won a Library of, Com of Congress award. She runs a charity which provides 850,000 books a week to children under the age of five in the Anglosphere. That's the countries speaking English. She also has, a ch allied to that charity, an adult literacy charity. And she recently delivered her 100 millionth book. That is absolutely astonishing. And that is, that is a good news story that that has done a lot of good to help with childhood literacy in many, many different parts of the world. So that is a very good point. I try to end on a positive every time we do one of these podcasts and we do one a week pretty much. And I thank you for that. That's a very good place to end. My thanks as always to Greg and my thanks to you for listening. Do please follow the official government advice wherever it is that you're listening, unless you're in Belarus where official government advice is awful. But do please be sensible, respect social distancing, don't go out unless you absolutely have to, and stay safe, stay safe for you and your family. We'll see you again next time. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.